Hi everyone, welcome to Tech Talks. Today we have four lovely guests and they all have the same cognitive functions, FI, SE, NI, and TE. And today we'll be comparing and contrasting their experiences. John as the ESFP, Michael as the INTJ, Casey as the ENTJ, and Sheila as the ISFP. And so John, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Sure. Uh, my name is John. I am obviously an ESFP. I am an Enneagram 8 wing 7. Um, I rely heavily on the extroverted sensing. And so therefore, like I've chosen career paths that ex excel that direction. So I am a bodyguard and I teach Olympic Taekwondo. I'm Michael <laughs> and I'm an INTJ, um, five wing four. And opposite of John, I, I rely a lot on introver introverted intuition. So I take a, not a lot of naps generally. <laughs> All right, I'm Casey, ENTJ, uh, Enneagram eight wing seven. Um, I am a, well, right now, telehealth, telemental therapist, um, counselor, family therapy, um, trauma. Um, yeah. I, uh, anything else you need me to say? That was good. Okay. And so Sheila? Hi, Al. I'm Sheila. Um, I'm a, I'm the ISFP in the group and I am, um, Enneagram four wing three. And, um, I did hair for many years for my career and now I'm a retired stay at home mom who homeschools her daughter. Lovely. And and so I'll have everyone's links down below. What do you all think is the most obvious differ differences between all of you? So I think this is actually an interesting group because we have like the drastics of each direction. Um, so we have the people that move before thinking. We have the people that think so much sometimes that they don't even move. And then everything in between. And so I think like that'll be a fun point to touch on. But I don't know what everybody else is looking for here. So. Yeah, I, I noticed the difference between the P's and the J's. The J's kind of move in a direction um, systematically, and P's can kind of go, well, well, we can go there, 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 or there, and we get to the same place either way. So it's just a, how we move different and operate different like in that regard. I always feel like I relate to everyone in our, in our, like, whatever we want to call it, our, our type group, um, really well. I mean, I've worked for a lot of ENTJs and it's been the best working relationships. Um, I have so many, uh, ISFP friends and also ESFPs. It always seems like a surprise, like when we meet one another that like how well we get along. So, I mean, moving away from the, from the differences I, and, and there's even like, uh, even with people who aren't familiar with, with type, there's a general like sense. I feel like when I've met people in the world who I would type as ESFP, where I'm like, where it's just this feeling of like, I feel like we, I feel like we shouldn't get along, but like, this is going great. <laughs> you know? I found myself like INTJs, I, I definitely gravitate towards but I think it's more of an envy thing. Like I just envy the way that you think so much that I try to emulate it and like, it draws me to you more. <laughs> yeah, and I, I feel like um, we all have a similar vibe. Like when you guys are speaking, I've watched a few of you guys on interviews and the language seems similar to mine. Like I'm tracking you, you know, just fine. You, I'm not like, what are they really saying or what are they meaning? So I understand the language pretty well and it does feel it's got a homey vibe when I hear people speaking the same functions I have, even if they're in a separate order, I might be like, oh, that's an interesting way they came about it, but it still comes down to being a similar concept and similar speech. So I noticed that. Yeah, FI, I feel like everyone who has FI, I am immediately, I click with because that's just the relational, aspect it's the inner values um i click with all of these types esfp intj isfp my best girlfriend is an esfp um i don't know as many isfps but um you know the ones i know i like a lot and intjs men women um just 
very, very similar way of operating as an ENTJ, just kind of flipped a little. Um, but yeah, the same functions definitely help in the relational um, connection a lot more than like opposites, like FE. Um, not that there's no clicking, but you know, the similarities are more so with these four types than maybe others. Yeah, there's like a kindred spirit element to the people in your in your type group. And yeah, John, I remember you calling INTJs your unicorns in the ESFP panel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what I don't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's no longer the the most like wrong typed person, right? Is that INFJ now? Yeah, INFJ is probably the most mistyped of all types. Like, um, I have a typing service, and everyone starts off going like, "I think that I'm an INFJ." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so fifty percent of the population has identified as that type. But I would say. In the official MBTI, people who take the official test, only 3% score INFJ. Whereas um, if they are just publicly typed by an online test, it's like 50%. So a different animal, like official MBTI is different than the online subreddits. Like, yeah. <laughs> What's the percentage of INTJ? I'm just curious. In the official MBTI statistics, it's probably 2 to 3%. So yeah, unicorn. It's, it is a unicorn. <laughs> well, there's that, and there's also the fact that like we don't tend to get out as much as other types. Although some of us are, are like we we do make a point of you know getting out into the world, but still like yeah, it's it's probably a small proportion, and like we don't tend to bump into one another very often either. Right. Um, I find that I click there, and I I hate to like I'm not trying to like take it to this just us. But like, I find that I click there mainly because you'll, your type will ground me like ESFP. I am flying everywhere. And to be around an INTJ, it kind of pulls me back a little bit, like pulls back on the reins. But I love it because that same relationship also kind of pulls them out of their patterns as well. So it kind of like, we find a neutral ground. That's a fun playground to be in. Yeah. yeah. And you said one of the things you love about INTJs is their intellectual appeal. Yes. It's very complimentary, like the fun ESFP meets the serious get down to business, just the <laughs> right. INTJ. We lighten it's usually up. usually almost we, too we, much, though. Yeah, we, we can tend to lighten up as the years go by. And we have, and we, we, <laughs> and we just have need to melt down. Them. We need to melt down a couple of times, and then um, we, we tend to <laughs> loosen up a little bit. Loosen just up a little bit. Yeah. ESFP in your life. <laughs> I'll show you the way. <laughs> what are ways that you help people loosen up, John? <laughs> I mean, as an ESFP. I mean, there's not a whole lot. Of <laughs> so there's not a whole lot of thought prior to movement. Like I was saying before, like I rely heavily on that extroverted sensing. So it is just go. It is just like, here I, here I am, here I go. They're even decision-making processes. It's just like, a, we're going to go left. And everybody's like, wait, what, what, what's to the right? And I'm like, I don't care. We're going left. Like, that's, that's just how we're doing things. <laughs> um, but I tend to be able to, I guess, ESFP is so charming, right? I tend to be able to, like, charm people into coming with me. So if I'm going left, everybody's going left. And it's a good time. And no matter what, we're going to have a good time. <laughs> yeah, the charmers for sure. And follow hmm. me where the fun is the stereotype, yeah. I guess, like, yeah, all of you guys, especially the guys, the girls too. I mean, my best friend, ESFP, she's a mom of three kids under three. My goodness. She's like, I have a break. Let's go do something fun right now. I'm like, I'm down. Okay. I can be spontaneous <laughs> too. In the name of fun. <laughs> I, I can be spontaneous too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's great. Levels you out. Could I just say, like, I think it's really interesting, Joyce, when you, when you do videos that, like, you have you have four or five of the same type, and it's like an immediate clicking, and we're still feeling each other out here. I feel like, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's interesting for sure. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Even like the pre-work before like making this whole thing, like you'll have the NTJs, like Michael will ask me like when we're setting up videos, so what's the structure? And then Casey's like, so what's the plan? I'm like, okay, I got to TE this. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the objective? It was like, like a one sentence. This is what my goal is. And like, sure, a plan's nice, but like, I don't need an agenda per se. I'm just someone who kind of wants to know what's up. What's your general overarching objective or goal? Yeah, oh, yeah no, I noticed I that. I messaged you 10 minutes beforehand and I was just like, all right, what are we doing? Let's I'm ready. Let's go. There's no prep. <laughs> Tap the foot, let's go. <laughs> you were catching Pokemon before this. I was. <laughs> yeah. Last time he was driving to Iowa in his car while filming the video for the channel. <laughs> it was quite spontaneous. What is something people wouldn't expect your type to do that you do? Being a counselor. <laughs> The helping profession um, doesn't make a lot of money. Like ENTJs are supposed to make just like gobs of money and only take jobs that only you know, provide them with the biggest profit, right? Um, stereotypically not me. Um, you know, you have to be more creative to make money. Yeah, that's a strength. Um, finding ways which, you know, are in my field that I can apply my skills to that you know, eventually lead to more return. Um, but yeah, kind of being in the let me help you with your feelings field is not uh, one of the things that an ENTJ would be known for. However, in this community where there are a lot of ENTJs, especially women, um, there are a lot of ENTJ women therapists, surprisingly. Um, so that's been cool to connect with them and like my female ENTJ groups and um, all that. Cause we're objective and, you know, we can follow the intervention through and not get taken hostage by the feels in the sessions and by you know, some other things that might weigh really heavy on people who just have that really big heart and really sensitive and we're kind of like, we have big hearts and we can be sensitive, but maybe not as much as others. <laughs> yeah, I I know another ENTJ also like in a job similar to yours, like he's a therapist and yeah, it, it seems like um, being an NJ might help in that field because um, it allows you to, to to know the general purpose of how, how to go about things. And, and like you can use your skill as your type to succeed in multiple different professions. And like you can be very creative with how you use like your ENTJ capacities to excel at being a role that is typically more feelery. But um, yeah, it just shows that there's more ways to slice a pie. You know, you can slice a pie as a feeler or you could slice a pie as a thinker, but you can still make a good therapist. Yeah, so any other things that you guys relate to that's not typical of your type? I mean, I'm, I'd say I'm, I'm, people might be surprised I'm really into extroverted sensing. Like I love like being just assaulted by strobe lights and loud noises like I, I love it it's just that i think i think the issue is that i i i have such an fe problem that when it's like a group uh scenario which a lot of those situations are then there's an issue because i always feel part from the group but i would go to like um i'm thinking of like one in particular like this site specific show in in new york that's like you walk around you have a mask on you're assaulted by just sensory stuff. And it was great because it was like being, it was like floating like out of body, but but experiencing all of this. So I think a lot of the issues I have with SE are actually like more FE issues. Like do not take me into a into a club or something, you know? I love the the fact that you <laughs> you use the term assaulted by, not like engulfed in or embraced, but like it's offensive. <laughs> That's, that's great. Defended um, my senses. Right. I think I would say the exact opposite. Um, honestly, I, people that would type me lately, and this has taken me a good four or five years to develop, but I think that perspectives is something that I'm really good at stepping into now. Definitely wasn't before. Um, and so it's actually frustrating to people who used to know me 
because they'll like try to start an argument about something like they'll bring up politics or they'll bring up current events. And I'm just like, yeah, but I can see where they're coming from on, you know, and I start to like break it all down. And I don't, I, I, I don't really choose a side anymore. And I'm just kind of like, eh, but I get how they got there. Like I'm starting to understand it. And that's not something that my type is typically known for. Usually we pick a side and you're strong on that side. So it's just, uh, but that's taken development. I think that's just taken time to step into. Mm -hmm. For me, I think, um, you know, with my TE being lower, um, you know, we usually, we, we don't take a, a good management role, but I've, I've managed a few salons in my life and I really step into that role well, and I have no problem telling people what they should or shouldn't do when I have that title in my personal life. I hate that. I don't want to ever tell people what to do or, um, you know, but when I know it's my job and I know, you know, that's other people are counting on me to be responsible. I, I take TE very seriously and I'm really good at managing people because I can see the, the human side of managing people and people do like to be treated with, um, kid gloves, especially in my industry, they like being treated with kid gloves a lot. And so I, for me with the AFI, I was always able to step into their shoes and be like, okay, if that was me, this is how I'd want to be spoken to. And it usually works. I mean, not always, um, but yeah, I think I managed my crew well for being an I, You said that you're a four wing three, correct? Mm-hmm. So do you think that that fantasy side of yourself kind of helps you step into those roles? Probably. Yeah. I'd say that the three wing helps with the success yeah. and wanting to like prosper and succeed. Yeah. yeah. Cause I know the, the end goal, you know, to, you know, make the company run smooth and the, all the employees work well together and the clients happy. So I see the big picture and the end goal and it's easy for me to play that out. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. What we're hearing a lot of is that like you can actually become like good or like okay at your inferior function, especially as you grow up. And it seems like, um, so I have a theory for this, Basically, I think that everything is filtered through your dominant function in that y you can become good at your inferior if your dominant function gives it permission to shine. So like basically, if your inferior isn't getting in the way of your dominant function's aims, then your, your psych will allow it. So as long as you can use TE like as an ISFP, but not have it bl block any of your FI desires or like um, you can use your TE as long as it it's not in a conflicting aim than your your dominant function. So like, uh, it's a different view on how you can see the stack. <laughs> yeah. So I do kind of have a question there. Um, there's a lot of people that would say that your blind spot cannot be developed. Like well, if it's your blind spot, it is your blind spot. So do you think that um, we just get into a space where it's almost like once we've researched MBTI so much, we understand what our blind spot is and what those traits are. And so we can fake it enough to trick ourselves even. So it's almost like fake it till you make it. Or does it actually develop? AJ Drenth and um, just from Myers-Briggs official stuff. Um, by the time you hit your 30s, you do start to develop that fourth function, our inferior. And especially being an IP or EP, um, you guys kind of pull up that fourth function um, quite easily. It's kind of natural. Um, it just depends on what direction for um, like in a positive way or a negative, um, you know, maladaptive way. So your TE could turn into something like really crazy. I don't know an example right now, but um, just something that under stress, you just kind of abuse that function. And it's like that infant, like that three-year-old kind of going crazy, not knowing what to do. Um, or, you know, as development progresses and you're older, um, it pulls up and shows up more positively. And like, it's, you manage things better. You're using your TE to get your thoughts across articulately. 
and um, so on and so forth. It's so interesting that you say like at 30, because I'm, I'm 31. So, and I said that it's been about four years of development yeah. to get perspective, but I would say that the most growth has happened in the last year and a half. So that's, there you that's go interesting. on the mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like being around perspective drivers? So who people who have an dominant or even maybe auxiliary to helps you develop it in your fourth slot, John? For sure. Um, so five years ago, if I had hung out with an INTJ, we would rub each other wrong pretty, pretty hard because they'd be like, well, you know, I think this, this and that. And I'd be like, no, you're wrong. Like it's one direction. We have to go one, like the one, one thing. Um, but spending so much time with them definitely helped to develop that and be like, oh, wait, you're right. There are other ways to think about things. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I also think um, society requires some of the functions more than other functions. So like TE, society requires TE more than it requires your FI. Um, and so I think it's like me, I'm left-handed, but because I live in a right-handed world, I've learned to do so much with my right hand. You know, if you're taking a stick shift car, it's right-handed, you know, you have to use your right foot for the gas pedal. So I think, with my TE low and when society and the tribe is demanding it out of you, you have to, you have to kind of work on those earlier than maybe if you might, if I was last and kind of working on myself and what I value that can come later in life. So um, yeah, I think some of the functions just get pulled out of you, especially depending on what um, career you, um, navigate towards also. That is so true. When I was um, first getting my certification in MBTI, the the type of metaphor or analogy they'll give to you is left-handedness left and right-handedness. So your dominant functions or the ones that you prefer are like your right hand and the ones that you don't have in your stack are like your left hand. You can still do them, but like it's the most natural mode of preference, the most um, autopilot that you'll have is, and what comes seamlessly, like if you do an exercise, you write with your right hand, and then you try the same with your left hand, you'll notice that it's harder with your left hand, but you can still do it. And it, over time, like some people are more ambidextrous too in general, but uh, over time, some people can develop proficiency with the hand that they're not born with. And like, so MBTI does not dictate like what you can only do, but it dictates what your dominant preference is first without like being taught. And during certification, they give you the example of like, I think either in one of the world wars, like they forced left-handed people to write with their right hand and, and you can do it. It's just that the, you, there's a kind of, your, your brain might fight against it a little bit, but you can still do it. And eventually it might become natural, but um, you always had that first predisposition. And that's what it's trying to get at. Mm -hmm. um, so funny story on that handedness. I was born left-handed and old world grandma made me a righty because it's <laughs> easier to be a righty in the world of dominant righties. And still to this day, everyone's like, why are you hold your pen so funny? I was born this way and now I can't write with my left hand. I've lost that ability. Um, so yeah, I wonder if it works that way. That is fascinating. <laughs> my dad tried to get me to be right-handed. He's constantly taking out of my left and putting it in my right. But my FI was like, nope, I'm a lefty. Nobody tells me to be a righty. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting it makes to see everybody's like reaction and facial expression. Like there are some that are just like, no. And then others that are like super expressive. This is fun. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> <laughs> I think it kind of depends on um, maybe more of the, the masculine or feminine getting into more objective typing stuff, like um, where our FI is. Like I feel my FI is more feminine, so I might be more expressive, but I don't know. I don't know what um, what that all entails. Interesting. And so much of this is interpretive too. So, I mean, I don't like to be so rigid to say like you shouldn't do something because it seems to slot into your inferior function, right? So much depends on nurture though. How did you grow up? Who did you grow up around? What were their functions? You know, what kind of uh, um, situation like allowed that function to develop in some certain way? I mean, it's different for, for everybody. 
Mm-hmm. Casey, you're a therapist, correct? Yes. Do you utilize MBTI quite often? Yeah. Um, so yeah, when I have private clients, I um, introduce the topic and ask them if they want to get into it and kind of let it be their choice because it's just a tool and it's not something that's like, this is what I'm advertising. I offer like typing stuff, but it's just a way to get me to understand them and where their strengths are and what works for them. Cause like one thing that might work for one type may not work for another. If I'm suggesting things um, it's, I find it helpful for me and they've told me they found it helpful for them. So I just kind of go with it. And if they want to explore it, a lot of people are excited. It's fun. I mean, they're inundated with all these quizzes. What princess are you? Like, okay, what personality type are you? And people get into it, especially my younger clients. Um, yeah, it's helpful. And also Enneagram um, I use with them. I don't want to like derail us and go off on a huge tangent, but I am curious to know when you have typed somebody, if they are in a career path that does not generally fit their type, do you see more mental health issues like depression or anything in that stance where they're like, I don't fit here? No, if they're unhappy with something specifically work related, I might point out, well, you know, this isn't where your skill set or your strengths lie, but you know, let's explore other roles within your company, or maybe you can talk to your manager about this option or doing more of these kinds of projects, not just trashing the whole thing, throw the baby out with the bathwater type thing, <laughs> but like, let's work with what you've got. We don't want to create this mass upheaval and like, oh my God, you've totally chose the wrong career. That's not helpful. <laughs> but um yeah, we just kind of go with it and point out where there's room for improvement or changes, like minor changes that they can achieve um, realistically and practically. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry, Joyce, I my thoughts. Oh, it's good. Yeah, you can ask as many random questions as you like. Um, <laughs> that was really thought provoking. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions for each other? <laughs> Who? Well, uh, um, I don't know why I'm so nervous. Are you guys making me nervous? <laughs> like, what I, was, I was it's, saying, like before, that like it's interesting seeing different type. Like we we're, we sort of have to sort of feel each other out because I mean we've like we've has John, you were on the five ESFP or the four ESFP video, right? Okay, just mm -hmm. click like this immediately. And uh, same with the same with the five INTJ video. And like we've all we've all connected here. I, I talked to Sheila and we get along, you know, we get along great. Throw us all together and it's sort of like you feel like you can go in so many different directions that it's yeah, like where, so where do questions. we I don't it's even like, what's, know. What's and next? I'm so timid, um, and I don't know why. Like um, I, I feel like I feel like I have a um like a mom watching me right now. I don't like, or like I have to be, I don't know <laughs> what I'm feeling, but I'm definitely feeling like anxiety and, and like, what if I say the wrong, like, I yeah, I just feel like I'm, I um, hate being on video and I don't know how many you've done, but this is my first one. I know Megan Lavota's asked me to do one and I was kind of like, I really don't like being on video. And then all of a sudden here comes Joyce and I'm like, <laughs> oh, she sent me this message like three weeks ago and Facebook doesn't allow messages from people who aren't your friends. And I'm like, oh, I need to respond. Oh, I'm going to say yes. And it was just kind of <laughs> like that. And then here I am. I'm like, ah, oh, crap, I'm on video. I, I, mm not my thing so i'm feeling that anxiety from just here i am on a youtube video like well, my, <laughs> shit, michael to do? your point it's like you know you get into a group of esfps and it's like these are my people like i know i know where we're going i know where our thoughts are pretty much headed even what was interesting about that group was the different ages you can see different sets of development as they climbed and i was like oh wow that's, that but i get where you know, the younger people are coming from, I get where the older, like, I, it's just, these are still my people. And if I were to do like an interview that like this, I think ideally, but I don't know, I'm, I'm also I, sexual when it comes to the Enneagram, ideally it would be one-on-one. -on -one. And then you throw me into a group of four different types and I'm like, I don't know where, where to feel this at. Like it's, it's so, ugh. 
Yeah, I definitely don't want to step on anyone's toes or feel like I say the wrong thing because I, because we share all the same functions, but we're, we're coming at them at different ways. So when I, I say something, somebody's coming at it a separate way and it sounds like I could be, say it rude or wrong. Yeah, it's like, and I'm very aware of is, that, is that dynamic. Is that maybe like an FP thing with a TJ thing? Is that like intimidating? Maybe, I don't know. And, and then when I said that, um, when you made your comment about your grandma, and and then all of a sudden I, I was just saying how my dad tried to, but I didn't change. Then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, did that make it sound like he changed and it was bad? And and like, I just was like feeling that. And I'm like, ah. Uh, oh. This is fascinating because all of this is an I that we're doing right now. And I hope, Joyce, you leave all of this in because all of this meta commentary on what we're doing is us all using NI. And I noticed this in profiling too. If someone's NI, there will be a meta commentary about the profiling session the entire time that you don't get from, from any. There will be like, am I answering this question? What are we doing right now? How are we getting along? All of those kinds of things. So like we're all doing like, we're all sharing that function right now. That's NI. Well, so what's funny about that is when you were saying it, like, what if I say the wrong thing to me? And I'm also looking at, you know, a three-year-old version of that. So to me, it's like, oh, there is no wrong thing. Like, we're all good. Just say, what you're gonna like, say whatever you're going to say. But yeah. And I'm very aware of my and I all the time in that sense, because that's like when I'm in a group of people, that is what I'm always focusing on is you know, the dynamics and the vibe and, are, you know, like a constant, like it's, it's almost like I wish I could turn it off because it just probably because it, it's not quite the three-year-old, it's a little more, you know, mature, but not mature enough to handle their responsibility. Uh, you know, it's like a teenager out behind the, um, you know, school smoking a cigarette, you know, it's like, <laughs> ah. <laughs> so. Like you're being scrutinized and looked under the microscope. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's weird. It's just. Um... I, I feel like it's a way to illustrate and just being natural and what we present. And like there is no wrong way, you know, there's there's just being natural and seeing how it presents itself on the camera. Yeah, yeah. it's probably the IP fear of what's what's you know where am i in this little you know tribe and what are they thinking and i hope i come off okay and you know it's just it's like that and it's just even though i'm mature and in the sense I, i'm gonna walk away and be like yeah it all worked out but in the moment it's like it gets a little stressful and i'm just like that ip just i can't turn it off <laughs> And this is Sheila's FI Dom too. And like, it's funny because I was feeling the same way actually, but like, I was gonna, I was gonna keep that a little closer to the vest. And Sheila's just like, just put it. <laughs> hey guys, this is what I'm feeling. <laughs> Does that make you guys uncomfortable? <laughs> no, I think it's good to be real and meta like that. Because yeah. when we're meta processing what's at the forefront, like the elephant in the room, that's when true progress can be made. Yeah. And I am always calling out that elephant in so many cases. And my husband's always like, Shh, don't go there today. And I'm like, no one wants to hear that. that. <laughs> and what's his type? Um, you know, he might be ESFP um, or ESTP. Him thinking, I'm thinking right around there. I'm not sure. Or he could be totally ENTJ or I don't <laughs> it's hard to type those we're closest with. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll be quiet now. It's it's awesome, Sheila, that you are raw and honest yeah. with your expression of what you're feeling. Because everyone else is probably feeling that, but they don't like they're not saying it. So you give them relief. It's you know like vicariously living through what someone else is saying. It's like I feel relieved off of you saying what I wanted to say, or right. like. Thank you for allowing me to be vulnerable with yeah. you, with myself, with everyone. Yeah. Hmm. 
Because, you know, TJs, we got to be strong. We got to, like like Michael said, keep them feelings close to our chest. Don't, don't let show it. Like, we're, we do that every day. If not, we'd be like crazy maniac. I don't know. I don't know what would happen. And like, that's my fear. What if I let it all out? Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> and I think that's also an FI to FI thing between all of us, because there are so many times where what Sheila said as well, where like you see something going on and you're like, I just want to call this out for what it is, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't feel appropriate, but like, I just want to like get everything on the table here, but you're sort of, you're, you're, you know, you feel just uh, uh, apprehensive about doing it, you know? I don't know that I feel apprehensive at all. Like, I don't think that I'm afraid of upsetting anybody. I more of think my fear is that I'm not smart enough to be here. <laughs> like when I get in here, I'm like, oh man, I, I'm not prepared, but I mean, such as life, like that's how I go about life. So every time I walk into a situation, I'm like, I'm not prepared. So I'm just going to go like, let, let's just do this. But when I sit with you guys and everybody starts talking, I'm like, Oh, I might not be smart enough. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. <laughs> <clears throat> no. You're you're plenty smart, John. Also, I'm curious. So we talked about like counseling and stuff. I was wondering how does an SFP go at counseling different than like an NTJ? Like, what are your approaches to it? And I'm wondering if it's different. Like, if you were to help someone through a problem, how do you guys typically oh. do it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, let me let me grab this one while I've got the thought. Uh, so I find myself, when I give advice, telling people <laughs> what I would do, what I think they should do, um, which is not the way to give advice. And that's something I've had to learn as well. The best way to give advice is to tell people what their options are and see what they think they should do within those options and kind of let them come to it themselves. But I have a tendency when I'm like speaking to somebody about their problems where I'm like, oh yeah, no, you need to just like grab this, go here, do this. Like that's X, Y, and Z here. There are no options. Just take this route. And so like, it's taken me a long time to sit, step back and be like, how do you feel about it? Because I don't, I haven't always cared. Most of the time I'm like, I already got the vibe from you. I know where you're headed and this is where you need to go. Um, so that's the, the biggest thing I've had to deal with with counseling other people because I'm almost like I need to step back and let them do their life instead of trying to take the reins and, and lead through. Yeah, <clears throat> it always ultimately fails because they need to be the one to call the shot, to, to buy into the idea that they are the ones who are going to want to do this particular thing. And um you know, I, I know which way they need to go. It's obvious. It's, it's like this, you can't see this. Well, come on, I'll show you. Well, no, like they, they need to come to that conclusion themselves and buy into the action and walk the steps towards the goal that they want. Um, and a lot of that helps from um, knowing what motivational interviewing is just, assessing where they are and like how bad do they like want to quit smoking or like they know it's bad for them it's bad for their health they're seeing the effects and they're sick and this and that but it's like if they don't want to do it you can tell them 10 ways to sunday like they gotta quit and they won't and this is what doctors used to struggle with and they've taken on mi when when they're seeing patients and it just changes the whole talk like and people are like yeah you know, like these are the reasons why I want to stop smoking. And, and these are the reasons why I want to do this particular thing. Okay. So, yeah. But it's so <laughs> tempting, so tempting to be like, just come here, especially with friends, personal per people where like, I'll throw my counseling skills out the window. I'm like, I don't need to be the, the therapist and like, you know, abide by these rules that I know work. <laughs> like I'm going to do it my way. Well, no, that's it's not being helpful to your friend. And it depends what I think the person's looking for. I mean, you got to figure out first, like, are you are you um, are you looking for advice or, or does the person just want to talk through something from their perspective? And if the person wants advice, then I in those cases, I am typically someone that friends do come to. I mean, because I get very strategic about like first figuring out like what do you want? Like, and that can take a really long time because a lot of times people just don't actually know like what their, what their desired outcome is. And then it's, 
It's making sure that their perspective on the situation is aligned with that goal. And then it's just step by step. How do you get there? And a lot of times it's like forcing people like you have to do this thing that you don't want to do. You have to say this thing to this person that you don't want to say and really like driving that driving that point home. But the first question is like, is the is the person looking for advice? Because I think there's a lot of times that people tend to give unsolicited advice and it's just, it's kind of extremely counterproductive. I've had my first conversation like that probably about eight months ago. I never experienced that until I called a friend and I was like, I just need to talk to you about something that's going on in my life. And this friend was literally like her first response was before we even get started, are you looking for advice or do you just want to vent? And I was like, oh, the... Uh, I guess I'm just here to vent. And she was like, okay, I'm all for it. And she kind of said, like, I do FaceTime a lot. But she just kind of sat back and listened. And it was the most interesting experience to have somebody cognitively be like, am I here to give you a path or are you just trying to talk to somebody? Like, I've never experienced that before. So that was that was very nice. And I guess uh, probably something I need to learn to take on as a skill. Yeah, we all do, for sure. Um, asking the person if, if they want you know, steps to solve their problem or do they just want validation? And yeah, that's really shitty. You know, like <laughs> your situation is really hard and that's all people want to hear more often than not. Yeah. Like, yeah. It seems yeah. like through your answers is like uh, John and Casey have a more TE approach. Like they'd like to say as it is like, okay, so this is what you have to do. <laughs> and so uh, I think it might have to do with the Enneagram 8 too. It might amplify the approach you take to wanting to help people. And so Michael takes a more like, you know, looking at what the other person might need, maybe a more perspectives approach and then like slowly getting to that. So that's really interesting. Well, so TE is in that 10 year old position. And how often is it that we like totally skip over the co-pilot and look back at the 10 year old and be like, hey, bro, what do you feel? Because I'm feeling it too. Let's go. <laughs> and we just kind of take that that role. So yeah, I feel that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I pull a lot, obviously, with my Dom TE, like, I've got this answer. And, and yeah, that's been something as a counselor, like, you're not giving advice to people. That's not the name of the game. That is not your role. You were their guide. You were there to lead them to their answers, their own answers, not yours. What works for them. And like, I gotta be like that in my personal life too. It's not a bad thing to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> for me, um, helping people, I've had a hard time because um, my first reaction is just wanting to jump in with the feeling with them and feel like, you know, like it's, it's weird because if say somebody comes to me really sad right away, I take on like sad, you know, like, it's like, I'll just go right into the emotion with them. So it took me a long time to just kind of keep that distance from them, I guess, in a way and, and try to keep more of a, practical mindset um and with my little te it's like i wanted to just throw the the tips at them be like well this is maybe you should try this maybe you should try that you could try this you could try that um and i wasn't ever married to any of those ideas it's just like it's like i just want to I guess maybe protect all the emotions so i'm reaching into my little bag of tricks and i'm just like Psh you know, throw it at them and they'll be like, oh, I like that one. I'm like, oh, that sounds great. You know, and then, oh, um, you know, they might run and try that. But I also always would be like, no, you know, maybe what I would do. And so I had to really stop and, and try not to make it about me because I think if I makes it about them a lot and I don't mean to, like say somebody comes to me and is like, oh, you know, I'm really sad. I lost my dog. And then I want to connect with them right away. And so what I'd be like, oh, I know I, I lost a dog once too, and it was horrible. And it took me a long time to realize that by me saying that it takes away from their grief and their sadness when I'm already, you know, I'm like, well, here's my sadness, but that's not what I was trying to ever do. It's just like, I wanted to connect to them with that's them. That's what women do. In a, in a, on a FI level, like, it's just like, 
you know, here's here's how I was sad too, and here's how you were sad, and we can be sad, you know, with the like we same circumstance. Yeah, and and I realize that that's not. Some people might think it's okay, but then there are a lot of people probably walk away and be like, oh, she made it all about her, <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, that's not what I meant. I just wanted you to not feel alone in your sadness, but I don't know. I don't know. And, and that's kind of the classic men versus women. Uh, women are going to be like, oh, really? Me too. Me too. Not because we're one-upping or anything but because we truly want to connect. Um, and as therapists, like you just automatically have to limit your self-disclosures and what you say, unless it contributes to your patient, your client. But yeah, like we automatically do that because we want to connect. And um, I don't know if people really do feel like you perceive it, like, oh, she made it about her. Cause they'll just keep going on about their own thing and like, throwing in some more validations. Like, yeah, that, that must be really hurtful or sad. The kind of softens that, that um, making it about us feeling. Michael, it's so interesting to watch you just observe. Like, I'm so curious as to what's going on in your head right now. <laughs> this is, I mean, this, this is the thing about doing this with five INTJs. Like we all have just the deadpan INTJ stare. Now I'm the only one with the absolute. <laughs> so stands out. I'm very engaged right now. I literally can't help it. <laughs> I, that's the less body movement I notice INTJs move, the more focused and like lasered into what they're doing. I mean, and when the I opposite too. If I don't have focus, I'm all over. I'm bouncing off the walls. Yeah, like if I'm not really like tunneled in on on something, like I'll mm -hmm. do quite the opposite. Yeah, yeah, that's like a, like a signature kind of introverted judger thing too. Um, but you know, I feel like if I'm not doing a little multitasking, maybe it's ADHD. Like I can't, it's hard for me to focus if just one thing is happening. Like I kind of need, like I've got soft music in the background. I need that to kind of drown out whatever else is going on in my head. Um, that's an extrovert thing, maybe an EPEJ thing. Um, yeah. Like a little shifting helps me like loosen and kind of be able to, refocus and and laser in better i agree cool <laughs> that, that was a really interesting talk i guess maybe we can try the cognitive functions and see how everyone experiences te and we can like compare and contrast so what are all of y'all experiences with te should we go top down i mean i'll go last te is my jam so, <laughs> first, oh, by all I means. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, it's just, I have no filter. I so, just say, yeah. I just, I, that's my TE. We're just thought, mouth, out it goes, whatever it was. We don't think about how it's affecting the person we say it to. We don't think about how it sounds. Um, we think it's a great idea because we thought about it. And that thought is just like, it's got this megaphone to the brain, just psh, it's so out. The internal, the internal dialogue post that everybody was freaking out about, I think a year ago. <laughs> Did you happen to read those where it's like some people just have no internal dialogue? Oh, yes. Um, I do have an internal monologue that, that like I hear myself talking. Yeah, I hear myself talking and my mouth echoes my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. So um, the thoughts are out and it actually helps me think when I am talking, I get them both going and it's like, I have the greatest ideas. Like, I just say them out loud and it, it helps me process. I process out loud. Yeah. That's really fantastic. They have a term for one that like impacts negatively in an FE way. So they call it like foot in mouth. Disease. Oh yeah, I had like yeah, yeah. Um, but it's cool. I, ha I had that. I've been more tactful on on um, watching what I say more, thinking like s pausing. Is that okay to say out loud? Sure, why not? Or mm, yeah, probably not. Sure. I am not good at that. So, <laughs> like, if I am in a stressful conversation, like say with, with a significant other or, you know, a parent figure or somebody that's like got a significant role in my life. And it's, it's stressful in the sense that we are like arguing. 
um, usually I tend to blurt out thoughts. And even if I'm trying to affirm them or negate them, I will give, I'll, I'll give both out loud. So I'll be like, oh, I can see where you're getting there because you, you would see X, Y, and Z. But also on the other hand, there's, you know, A, B, and C. And then I like start to put them together, but I do it all out loud. And so people look at me like I'm crazy. Like they will just watch me and be like, are you just processing here? Or do you want me to hear this? Like, I don't know where that's at. <laughs> I have a tendency to process out loud pretty hard. Yeah. How about you guys, introverts? So I'm, I'm auxiliary, so I guess I'll go next. I, I think I do, so I, it's interesting about like having having a filter or not having a filter because it's like I'm NI first, so anything that's happening, I'm just a second, like I'm I'm right in front of it thinking if, if this happens, then what are all the ripple effects of, of saying that or doing that? So that can that can be a very that can be an asset, but it can also be if there's too much going on, then you're tracking a lot of those things at once, and you can you can freeze up. So I think like with TE for me, it's always at odds with FI, or they're always like working together or against one another. So it's like if if something is not meaningful to me, like if this is work that doesn't like hit me in a meaningful place or it has like some sort of some sort of value to me then it's just a slog getting everything anything done and i can just completely shut down if it's meaningful in some way or if i can make some meaning and sometimes like just manufacture it and it's kind of a fake then it's like straight through to the end goal like this step to that to that to that to that However complicated it is, I'm totally focused in on that thing. But as soon as you fall outside of that, I feel like it's, I can just see every way in which everything can fall apart. I can see everything that I don't have control over that can come in and completely wipe, wipe this out and get overwhelmed by that. So I think there's a lot of SE inferior there too, where like if there's, if there's if there's too much going on or i allow too much room to consider like everything that could go catastrophically wrong here then um you know when that happens i can i can tend to the te sort of drifts <laughs> drifts away from me at that point for me i can very re relate to foot in your mouth um i will say the most absurd thing sometimes but I've thought about them. I know the consequences and yet I don't care and I'm saying it anyhow, kind of like, by the time I stick my foot in my mouth, I'm just like, no, this person's pissed me off enough. This is what I need to get out. And so, and then sometimes I'm, I'm shocked that I actually am like saying it. That's where I think I'm more like, whoa, did I just say that? Like, cause, it was in my mind and I was probably grappling with, Oh, I should and shouldn't. And then I'm, then I'm Nope, I'm doing it. And so, yeah, I've, um, I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble, but I'm, I'm, I know the consequences and I'm prepared to deal with them when I do do that. So it's not often, but they're usually big ones. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the strong FI pulling up that TE from, from a place of your values. This is what I'm value. I'm standing my ground on this and letting you have it. <laughs> letting it rip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so where do you guys think you guys like differ in that experience of TE? Like, did you guys notice any discrepancies in how you each other voiced it from your own experience? Hmm. Yeah, I don't have any specific things I noticed. I related so to all of it. It just comes out in different in in different ways at different times, you know. And there's there's uh yeah, but I, I relate to all of it for for sure. Yeah, Sorry, Gila. No, and Casey just sounds like it just comes so easily and naturally and effortlessly. And for me, it's just like this big ta-da! Here's my TE, everybody. You know. Um, <laughs> Look, mom, look at my picture. Yeah. <laughs> Here's my TE on a platter for you. <laughs> but yeah, that's um, really cool. And so 
let's tackle its its opposite on the axis, so FI. And so perhaps we'll start yeah. with the dominant FI user, Sheila, first. So what is your experience of FI, like in a short way? All right, because yeah, I could take a, an hour here. No, um, <laughs> FI, for me, it's just, it is easy um, to know my values, what is important to me, how I prior, prior, prioritize everything, um, just my likes and dislikes right away, how I feel in situations, if I'm comfortable or not comfortable, is this gives me this vibe, that vibe. Um, and ranking everything in my life for prioritizing things, like I know you know, this person's here, this person's there. If this person does this, they drop down to here or they could go up to here. It's just constant all day long, knowing exactly fine tuning everything that embodies my values and beliefs and my system, I guess. Yeah, that's super cool. And mm -hmm. so we'll go to the FI auxiliary. So John. <laughs> It's funny. I I relate to that. Like I always know how I feel about something, but my question is always why. Like why do I feel that way? Um, and it's usually very hard for me to answer. And so it takes a lot of like diving in and and addressing those things because like I don't know. I can be in a conversation with somebody and feel accosted or feel like very upset about something, and then I have to I have to pause and be like, but why? Like that doesn't make sense. Like, why are my values what they are? Why do I feel so strongly about such things? And so it's, it's always very confusing inside my head. It's an internal battle. So it's better just to turn it off. If I just ignore my co-pilot, then I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I'm the tertiary, I guess. Yeah, that sounds that sounds very NI, John. That sounds good, getting caught up in, in NI with that, with that why, asking why, asking why. Um, I'm always pretty hyper aware of why. I don't necessarily have control over it though, over what's going on with the FI. So it's like, sometimes it, there's, a, there's a helpless feeling. But um, I've always felt, I mean, I've always felt very, very high FI for better or for worse. I mean, I'll fall into it uh, quite often and it can be very productive with, with TE because it's like, it's, you know, it spurs creativity, right? You're creating out of it and you can, you can actually make something, but you can also get caught up or I can in like, um, caught up in a feeling, not having control over it or, or being overwhelmed by it and completely dissociating from, uh, from a situation. So it can, it can fall into that. And there's also like an embrace of the full emotional spectrum. I feel like for me, we're like, I'd never, I, I'm I'm also a, a friend who like at least my close friends would come to me if something like really just dark was going on because I have like a lot of space for that, um, which I which I tag with fi as well. Yeah, so mine can definitely be the baby. I can be sappy and you know just really in that. I guess what free NTJs would be the fi grip, um, just kind of like in that dark place when FI doesn't know what to do and can kind of go dark like that just by itself. Um, but using it to support the other functions can mean, you know, I am very in touch with what I value, kind of like what Sheila was saying, just those dominant positive traits of the function, um, you know, standing up for what you believe in and like fighting for what's right. And, um, you know, those things, you know, come as you grow more and develop and get older. Interesting. So personality hacker says that like for inferior FI, how it can manifest is like set and forget. So it's almost like your emotions are unchanging, like the tide. Um, would you say that that's accurate or not? unchanging like the tide or always changing or I'm not sure what it means. Do you like when you set your FI, do you revise it often or do you do you just set it? What does set mean? I, I don't not familiar with that. Do you mean values, Joyce? Like if you set because I think that's a lot of a lot of what comes out of that 
interpretation is that there's like a very black and white approach to uh, uh, values in some cases, moral, morally very, very rigid. Um, I'm not morally rigid, but I find myself having more morals than most people. Kind of like a do what's right is a ENTJ trait, and that might come from that inferior FI, um, really growing and developing in the positive way. Um, am I answering your question? What is set? I'm kind of curious now. Set and forget. What does that mean? Their hypothesis was that, you know, for the inferior FI of ENTJs, like they, they kind of like make up their mind, they decide, and then they keep it like that. So they oh, decide on their values. Decision. Oh no, one, I can always change a decision and revise, um, especially if I'm feeling a certain way. I don't hold grudges. I don't get, I don't get like what I consider ENFP FI grudge. Like once I have my best friend, once she gets in her way a set of how she feels about something, it's unwavering. I'm like, well, I mean, you present more evidence to me and I know more about the situation. I can feel differently about it with another perspective, I guess. Maybe that's personally being more open, higher on an openness scale on the big five. I don't know what that is, but the, I don't know if that set and forget is accurate for ENTJs. It could be, I don't know. But I think that's the case of what Joyce, you were talking about earlier of other functions coming into play, right? Because then, you know, that, that sounds like a TE approach, like what, what needs to be done about this, but also that new perspective would be NI as well. So it's sort of those are sort of flanking the FI, it sounds like, and sort of allowing it yeah. to be like a healthy function. I don't, I don't remember. I'm trying to think of maybe a time I was unhealthy when that may have been the case, but I, I don't even think like in my teens or twenties, I was like that before. I think I've always had healthy FI DOMs in my life, like INFPs kind of show me how to use it. And I just skipped that whole hot mess FI thing. I don't know. That's Do you look at FI as being a hot mess in your, in being, the, you know, your fourth, you're like, like you don't have a lot of control over it. It's like a slippery little bar of soap in the shower where you're like, I think I have it. And then it's just like, poof, gone. Yeah, a lot of it was, I don't understand this. I, I don't, I don't understand this yet. Probably when I was younger. Um, what are these feelings? How do I deal with them? I know what thoughts are. I can, I can do those. But these feelings, whew, they're just out of nowhere. <laughs> I, I think we touched on this a little bit in the, uh, the four ESFPs or whatever. But like there was a stage in life where you could present me with all of the information and try to change my mind and i'd be like it doesn't matter how much you tell me like I, i'm still here this is still my my viewpoint i'm stuck i'm stuck like i'm sticking with it um and it's like i said i've been going through a lot of development and, and perspectives and things and that has changed drastically within the last few years but there was definitely a point in my life say 25 26 where i would be like you could tell me that the rock is blue i can see that it's blue but i already decided last week that it was red so it's, it's gonna stay red like it is red. <laughs> so that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause in this case, like John's example sounds more like set in set in stone than, than yours, Casey. And I wonder what factors have to do with it. Maybe environmental. Uh, well, I guess we'll figure out with more panels in the future too. And maybe I'll provide clarity, but interesting experiences guys. So I'd like to move on to the cognitive function and I, and so we'll start with the NI driver, Michael. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm, I've been working for a couple of weeks. I'm, I'm making a video about like trying to illustrate how NI actually works because it's the question that keeps coming up is like, what does this actually look like? So I'm really trying to work through like, if you could say step-by-step, step, like how you go from A to B with NI, um, what would that look like in like SE terms? So I'm working on that. I don't have it yet, so I can't say <laughs> right now. Um, it's a very, it's a very strange function. It's very much. Um, I feel like in isolation, it's always taking like any, any data, any data, and like shooting it through a prism, and saying like, what's every like, um, how could this look from any point of view? What could this mean from, from any different perspective? Where could each of these threads lead? How do all of those 
converge in some way? What's the what's the most likely outcome of something? How is this person interpreting what that person is saying or what they themselves are saying? Is there cognitive dissonance that that's happening here in someone or in myself? Like those kinds of those kinds of things. So it's a very like it's a very sort of um, I think the difficulty is it's hard to separate it from judgment. It's hard to separate it from TENFI um, because a lot of times, like in describing it, it always tips into one or the other. Like, what's the best way to do something, you know? But it's more like, what's, what's, I don't know, like, what's, what could possibly be going on in any situation is what it feels like. Very hard for me to describe, though. And I, I noticed with, everyone describing their dominant functions so far we have dove so far deep in this stuff like we it it's a more complicated like i have to really listen to what you guys are saying to like follow because it's just so natural for you and so like dense it's got more just information in there because that's like where you live every day um uh, so I guess I'll go with my and I um, kind of like that, trying to see the big picture, the pattern. Um, it supports my TE. It's, you know, my TE's buddy. Like, I would be lost without it. I wouldn't, like, really know how to be decisive and make decisions and um, interpret things and have insight if I didn't have my and I. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's always been a big part of who I was, even at an early age. They always kind of paired up nicely once I, um, you know, probably like high school and then definitely more in college. And so there's, it was always strong in the twenties and now it's just the TE and I, that they don't know how to work separately, I guess. I know, um, you know, so in OP terms, all four of us have, F I N I sleep is what they call it, you know. So whenever we're doing our sleep process and thinking about, you know, things and processing and going over stuff, it's F I N I, um, and all four of us do it. So how I how I do it because my F I is so first, and then my N I is third. Is like my N I and F I work really well when I'm thinking about what's my purpose in this world, why am I here, what's my goal. How can I be better? How can, you know, I make this relationship better? So it's like constantly, like, I can't almost take my FI out when I'm thinking about my NI, because when I'm thinking about the future, it's not that I'm ever thinking about future other people. It's like my future, my goals, my end thing that I want to accomplish in life. Yes, there's other people involved in that, but it's like, that's when I'm just kind of like sitting on the couch going, wow, why am I here on this planet, you know, and thinking, is, you know, I'm bringing everything together. So um, I just, I, I love pondering and thinking and yeah, I, I, the NI is fun for me and fairly easy, but I'm really aware of it. It doesn't come like autopilot. It's just like, but yeah, sorry if I, I don't know if I went off on a weird oh, tangent. Oh, that makes sense. That's what NI does. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, how about your experience? I think I already touched on it a little bit. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you really did. Yeah. And, and so let's uh, head to SE. And so, John, it's your domain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want to tell us a bit? I think there's two parts to that. I think there's the physical part and the mental part. Um, I find myself ahead of many people that I know as far as friends and stuff when it comes to being present in the moment, like being exactly where I am, right where it is. And people will be like, well, what are, what are we going to do in five years? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not five years from now. Like tomorrow could change the course of every decision we make. So what's the point in planning on it? Like what's the, what's the point in writing it out? Um, and so I find myself often being just very, very present and like stable in my moment. Uh, but on the physical side, like, and I love it because like, obviously I would love it. It's dominant, but I just feel as though I do kind of navigate this world with ease. Um, like when you called me and or last time when I was like, Hey, I have a client that I have to go out to Iowa for, uh, 
I'm going to take this call on a drive. And you were like, are you sure that you can drive without being distracted? And I was like, oh, ESFP. You're like, yeah, I'll be all right. <laughs> like, just because that kind of is the like dominant function. I'm going to drive easily and then still be present in everything else that's going on. Um, so that's kind of my experience with it. And I get to capitalize on it again. Like I told you in the very beginning, like I do private security and like bodyguard work. And I find that all of my actions are very smooth. All of my steps are very like paced and easy to, to go by. And if anything arises, I can handle it pretty quickly. And so that's, that's my experience with SC. <laughs> For me, SC comes pretty naturally also. Um, just, you know, played all the sports when I was younger and I loved, you know, just being, you know, like quick too. Like, um, it's just like, in the moment, just uh, you gotta think quick, act quick. If you hesitate, then you know you've wasted time, and the outcome could have, you know, could just be a disaster. And I also love, um, you know, being physical. Like so much of when when I'm really processing things, it's like I want to go for a walk. I want to go in the garden and pull weeds and be physical and do all the the things while I'm processing stuff up in my head. It's like, I can't just sit on a couch and be like, stare at a corner in the wall. It's like, I'll, you know, want to crawl out of my skin. It's like, I got to go for a walk or do something to help get the, the mind flowing. I think when I'm doing the SE things, it's just like, okay, my gears are clicking, they're moving. I can, the rest is all, you know, well-oiled machine and it flows good. Um, and I just, yeah, I'm, I don't hesitate on decisions either. I'm not like, oh, should we do this? Should we do that? I don't know. It's just like, this is what I want to do and it'll do it. And um, I don't have, I don't look back and second question myself a lot too with that. So yeah, I, you, I love the SE. Do you find that you don't often um, step into places of anxiety? Like I, I, I find that the only time I have anxiety is when I'm trying to pace myself or look to the future or plan something out. Uh, but if I just stay, if I just stay within my own head and stay right here, there's no anxiety. It doesn't exist. I'm just like, all right, well, here we are. This is the moment. So do you find that like having SE up, up there as, in the, as your second function, does the anxiety kind of fall off? Yeah, I think. I think if I start thinking about it too much, then that's when the anxiety will creep in. Um, so it's like, I, I don't, I, it's like having your blinders on a little bit like, okay, no, I'm just, I don't want to, yeah, second guess myself. And so I, and anxiety, I don't have a ton of anxiety in my life. Like I'm not one to stress about things because I just have the, everything's going to work out fine, you know, mindset. And like you, I don't like to plan too far out in the future because tomorrow I could be dead, you know, or the whole world could blow up. And so it's like, well, then I just wasted all this time planning for nothing when I could have been doing. So I definitely um, value the SE over the NI. You could tell that. There was a long time ago that I don't, I don't even remember the episode, but Joel was telling a story where he was talking about like, you can get a flat tire and in that moment or your car breaks down or whatever, and you're on the side of the road, you can either be just devastated by it or kind of just sitting there. You're like, Oh, this is going to be a funny story in a couple of years. Like you can kind of laugh about it. And I've always found myself in that laughable space. Like car could be smoking on the side of the highway. And I'm just like, Oh, that sucks. Like, but it's here. Yeah. It's a new adventure. Something, something, more fun or something different will take you off that path and be like, oh, well, we're on this path now. Who cares? I have a smoking car. We can get in this car with this complete stranger who drives us to a town. And yeah, it's like you're just ready to go with the flow. Yeah. And like my SC being on third, like it can go either way. Um, I can go with the flow or I can be like, I should have planned better. Right. Because wanting to plan is kind of like the natural J thing. Um, but as far as other attributes of SE, I've always been into, um, you know, like, ex I guess, extreme sports like skiing, snowboarding, horseback riding. That can be kind of extreme. <laughs> um, um, I haven't sky dove yet, but open to that. Um, 
I like roller coasters. I like physical sensation, like sensory experience. Um, I like to dance. Um, I, don't know. I appreciate the arts, like visual. I love music. Um, any kind of stimulation that that's um, my jam. But yeah, going with the flow. I've learned to do better. Um, and I have a group of coworkers who they don't go with the flow. And I found myself being like the least anxious one of the group. Like, so what? We don't know what's happening yet. It's okay. Like, this happens all the time. If you plan, if you have like put a lot of energy into a plan of yours and it doesn't go well on a scale of one to 10, how do you like, is it, Oh my goodness. I'm so upset. Or, you know, like I'm pretty where? upset. I probably followed around a seven. Okay. Um, you know, I, I planned Disney world for my son's like first year birthday and COVID hit that I was pretty bummed out. Cause I spent like two months planning and you know how it goes when you go to Disney, if you've ever planned a trip there, but you kind of got to go down to like the day. And I was like, shit, I just wasted so much time. Not that the plan didn't work out, but like, I didn't have to do all that. Not that I knew this would happen, but yeah, kind of bummed. But. I love the fact that you're like, if you've ever planned a trip to Disney, cause I'm like, no, uh, I went to Disney, but there was <laughs> like, I did not plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a planner either. Like, I, and like we did a road trip once and it was a two week road trip and I just, it was just before like, you know, we had cell phones. Um, I just, my husband and I, we bought an Atlas, hopped in a car and we had a final destination and we just like pulled into a town when we were hungry. We pulled into a town to, you know, sleep or need gas, like no plans and plans. Like if we have to, if I have to be like, you know, at, you know, at this place at two o'clock and then we have to eat and then go here at three o'clock. I'm just like, ah, you know, like that just stresses me out. Do you find plans like that relaxing? Um, they, they can be <laughs> like, you know, like it just depends. I'll go with the flow. But if we have somewhere to be like we had tickets to something, I'm like, we got to show up on time, guys. But um. Otherwise, I understand that things happen and the way you wanted it to go will fall through. And um, it just is what it is. And I try to accept that a little bit more. How's that sound for you, Michael? <laughs> if, if I don't have a plan, then it's it's not it's nothing neurotic about having the plan. It's just the fact that it just it just constantly keeps popping into my mind. Oh, wait, I got to be here at this time. Oh, wait, I got to call this person back. I don't want any of that stuff up here. It's like, I feel like the plan just frees up that time so that I can trust that like, I know where, um, where I need to, where I need to be at any point. And it's not just spontaneously just popping up into mind that I have to do this or that thing. Yeah. Do you find comfort there? Do I find comfort there? Oh yeah. 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 Not comfort, but freedom. Freedom, because all of that stuff is organized and I can like trust that I don't, that anything that pops into mind, I don't necessarily have to pay attention to it. Whereas if I'm not, if things aren't ordered, then I have to constantly say, wait a minute, that thing, do I need to, do I need to keep an eye on that thing? You know what I mean? I can always push something away if everything's in order. So yeah. So yeah. I'm learning like that big time with um, my NI third is that freedom because i have spent my whole life just all these things oh i got to do this i should do that you know like it is constantly like stresses me out but yet i don't use the planning to get that stress out so later in my life i'm like oh my gosh if i just plan this and do this then i don't have to stress about the thing but it's a total revelation for me you know so um yeah to to live in that space first would be so freeing yeah, so there's a lot of gold nuggets in this conversation. And what we learned here was that like judges feel freedom from planning. So when when they plan, there's a freedom because then they'll be prepared and so they can then enjoy the moment or else like without the plan, there's a kind of like you're subject to whatever in the moment is happening. Cause like for the judger, the freedom is in the ability to- um, More control with more the plan. More control, yeah. 
more control with the plan. Whereas perceivers feel more freedom when it's open ended and they can in the moment adapt. And so it seems like the biggest differentiator with types with um, the same cognitive functions is actually the dichotomies. So I very obviously like I, I would be able to type based off of the like the di dichotomies. If I were to not use the dichotomies, it'd be hard to to know where the differences lie sometimes if I, in a short period of time. Do you know what I mean? Like I like I what I'm saying is like the di the dichotomies get a lot of like flack. Like people don't like them, but they're useful when you're sure about the functions and all you have to do is like place where exactly they fit. So like the functions are the most important part. So you have to make sure that like a person aligns with those first and foremost. But when you get that down, like the dichotomies are useful for determining type. And so what I'm saying is like, if you're typing someone, like I know that dichotomies get flack for how it's just like a behavior that someone is showing, but it's not, cause it's also like, it goes back to your wiring too. And like it showed here, cause I, I feel like the biggest difference between all of you guys were actually the dichotomies. And I know I'm, I'm kind of rambling at this point, but um, because we're time limited, uh, thank you guys for coming out. Um, it was a pleasure to talk to you all. You guys are such like a bundle of FI joy. Um, <laughs> I loved mm -hmm. talking about your functions with you guys and just seeing your perspectives, hearing about them, you know, seeing all the different career paths that you are a part of, like, it's very interesting, Casey, how you're in therapy. And I feel like it really helps represent like ENTJs in a new perspective for people to see. And so thank you for bringing that out and showing what the yeah. ENTJ personality is capable of. And thank you, Sheila, for, you know, being so open and honest with your feelings and, you know, giving people permission to also be open and honest with how they actually feel. It, it, it's warming. And <laughs> thank you, John, for your funny com commentary, like your, your witty comments and just like <laughs> your funny remarks uh, actually bring a smile to my face a lot so thank you and michael you're you're good at like noticing functions in people so thank you like when it comes up you're like oh i see it i see that and i or you help illustrate how these functions show up in real life and i bet that's helped a lot of people too and so i'm just grateful for the time we spent together and i'm sure it was really enriching yeah, it was at least enriching for me yeah I, i'm glad i did this didn't know how long we were gonna go um but yeah, this has been great. And we could honestly talk all day. There's so many things to talk about and I'm down to do it again. Um, and I'll plan for a longer time slot. Hey, plan. <laughs> you know, cause that's, that's what I do. <laughs> that's um, awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah. It was I, great hanging out. And I guess, um, thank you audience members for tuning in this far. You are great. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye, y'all. All right. Bye. See you guys.